Hello and welcome to this Innovation and Good Practice webinar brought to you by Event Scotland Learning in partnership with the Innovation and Good Practice work stream of the Event Industry Advisory Group. We're going to hear some fantastic stories about how Scottish and international event organisers chose their digital platforms. We've all had to adapt to a totally new environment. Working in a new medium is always a challenge, but it does create some very interesting results. So we're delighted to hear from Caitlin McNaughton, Communications and Partnerships Manager for Melbourne Fringe, and Leslie Shaw, producer of Celtic Connections. After their case studies, we'll go on to a panel discussion. Please do ask us questions. You should be able to see a toolbar in the vertical panel to the right-hand side where there is a questions box. I should probably point out that none of us are technical experts on the platforms. We're here to provide our own experiences of choosing and using platforms. So first, let me share with you Host City's experience of this. If you don't know about Host City, we are the largest meeting of cities and sports, business and cultural events. Um, it was launched actually as a magazine in 2004 for the organisers of the Beijing Olympic Games. We share expertise between major events organisers and we launched a conference in 2014 to do this. Um, this grew into a marketplace event that takes place every Q4 in Glasgow. And by 2019, we have 350 people and 30 exhibition stands. You can see there the um, full um, conference venue at the Technology and Innovation Centre in Glasgow and the um, thriving exhibition area. Host City is the event for events, so we needed to support the events industry in its moment of crisis. Covid forced us to find a way to provide content, networking and exhibition in a digital environment. But like most event organisers, we had no real digital strategy or experience of digital events. So how did we do this? We started by searching and contacting companies. Um, we did a lot of, have a lot of conversations and, and demonstrations. Um, we had time was on our side because our event was at the end of the year in December, so we could watch and learn from other events. What surprised us most was how wildly different the prices varied by a factor of almost 10. Even the less expensive op options are a lot of money, comparable to the cost of running a physical conference. The most expensive ones have fancy graphics in you know, VR style and avatars, which does add to the feeling of being at an event, but we didn't feel that it really added to the functionality that we required. Um, we identified our must-haves, which were a main stage, an expo area, networking and production support. Um, we realised it was essential to work with a production company. In the past, with a live event, we produced the whole thing ourselves. With a digital um, domain, it's a different story. It's like a TV production. There's a lot of pre-production graphics, audio, visual connectivity, test calls, and also dealing with live technical issues on the day. Glasgow Convention Bureau recommended Cameron, a Scottish event production company who had delivered digital events before COVID. Um, here is um, how the, the event looked. Um, one of our keynote speakers there, Etienne Fauvois um, from the Paris Olympic Games. And the platform we chose was called Hopin. Why did we choose Hopin? Well, it was Cameron's preferred platform, um, but we also found that it, it met all of our must-haves, had a main stage, had an expo facility and networking, which is crucial. Um, we found it cost-effective with a clean and simple interface, but it also had great functionality for streamed workshops. Now, digital is great for streamed content because you're not restricted by space or audience size. Um, breakout workshops can help make people feel more involved and connected. We brought together directors of UK Festival 2022 and Coventry City of Culture with all of the cities bidding for City of Culture 2025. We also created spaces for our sponsors to share expertise with the organisers of upcoming major games like the Birmingham Commonwealth Games and the Paris Olympic Games. Just two examples of um, activities we did there which um, really helped to, to bring um, people together that wouldn't have had a forum to meet otherwise. Um, Main stage content is like a TV production, really. Scheduling is, is very, very important. Every speaker, live or backstage, needs a channel. Now, these channels are limited, um, and the limited number of channels meant that we couldn't run panel discussions back to back, um, which perhaps was, was no bad thing. I changed the format of our conference slightly. Um, as a media and events company, we love live content. Um, but event producers like to reduce risk. We had 101 speakers. Only four of these um, were actually pre-recorded presentations. The others were live and they all had test calls before the event, apart from one or two, including the World Health Organization, whose Deputy Director General didn't confirm to speak until an hour before he actually went live and wanted to do a live Q&A with me on the day, which was great content, but um, you, wouldn't, so <clears throat> you wouldn't really want to plan a, um, 
a two day conference with 100 speakers doing that. So it's about finding a balance. Towards the end of the opening panel, the live stream did drop out on us briefly. Um, this falls down to a media drive outage. Apparently, um, Hopkin had to move the server. Um, the producers had a backup line and the main, main stage was live again after a 15 minute break. Um, so you need to make sure that whoever you're working with does have backups in place in case of um, <coughs> technical issues like that. In 2019, we had 350 people paying up to 1,200 to come to our um, our physical event um, in Glasgow. But when we went digital, we felt we needed to make it free to make sure that we had a good sized audience. And we did have a thousand registrants, um, each spending an average six hours on the platform, which is great engagement. Most virtual conferences do tend to make their money through sponsorship rather than ticketing. And it's important to involve sponsors in content and branding, we thought. An example of this is um, how um, we supported, well, we are supported by Event Scotland and Glasgow Life, and we were keen to make sure delegates felt like they were having the host city Glasgow experience wherever they were watching from. Um, we did this with a branded frame throughout the event, and background photos were um, displayed throughout the conference um, to reflect the content and also to give a sense of place. We also wove Scottish stories into the conference content. Um, there's lots of talk about um, the hybrid future of events. Um, it, it, it is complex and we're looking into, you know, we're not sure, um, entirely sure what the landscape is going to be like in December in terms of the ability to stage um, international conferences. Um, so let's um, look at this quote from ICA, the International Congress and Convention um, Association. Face-to-face -face events and virtual sessions don't merge well, they highlight, um, but they do also point out that we all move through our daily lives navigating the physical and digital worlds seamlessly and intuitively uh, but there is work to do to um to bring this into the um the conferencing world so just um a few um, key takeaways to finish um, find a good production partner to handle the big technical challenges make the most of the opportunity to provide lots of great content and this will create a space for branding so that you can monetize and grow and i'll just leave you with this um, quote from one of our um happy attendees um, who said the host city was the best virtual conference that she had attended in 2020 and um, the fact that we had um, a, a good platform was um, a, a large part of, of the success of course. So thanks very much for listening and um, we hope to see you at host city 2021 on the 7th to 8th of December. Um, you can register um, for our newsletter at hostcity.com and um, we'll keep you updated on, on our plans there. And, uh, Please do get in touch on the email address there, ben.aveson at um, hostcity.com. Okay, so um, there's the conference organizers' perspective. Now we're all very excited to find out how major festivals have managed the transition to digital. Um, and we're joined here by Caitlin McNaughton, the Communications and Partnerships Manager for Melbourne Fringe. Um, good evening, Caitlin. Please can you tell us the story of how Melbourne Fringe went digital? Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, that's all really interesting. I think, um, yeah, we have a very different um, case study at Melbourne Fringe, um, a small kind of arts organisation reliant on um, a little bit of government funding, some ticket sales, um, and, you know, a handful of partners. <clears throat> uh, just to give you a bit of context, because obviously, uh, you're all in Scotland and I'm in Melbourne in Australia. Um, Melbourne Fringe is uh, an arts organisation. We run a venue year round, uh, we run a festival and we run a range of arts sector leadership programmes. Uh, and the kind of focus I guess of this um, presentation will be the festival. Uh, so we run over two and a half weeks uh, across pretty much every art form that you can imagine. Uh, we usually have about 3,000 artists, uh, 450 events, over 170 venues, and our, our normal attendance is about 360,000. Um, and kind of like Edinburgh Fringe, uh, we are predominantly an open access festival. So um, that posed a series of particular challenges um, for us in, in developing digital content. Um, and so like, a lot of uh, arts organisations and event companies in March of 2020, we realised uh, that we would need a digital alternative uh, for our festival, which was due to take place in September. 
Uh, and so we kind of started these working groups where we all came together and just um, put down our thoughts of what a digital uh, open access festival would look like. Uh, and you can see the kind of key priorities that we um, came to there. Um, the, the main one was that we wanted to recreate a sense of community and connection um, that you can only get really from that kind of thriving arts festival environment. Um, and that was important that we could do that for our audiences, but also for our artists putting on the shows. Um, and also because we, what ended up being over 250 events, uh, all different art forms, kind of different levels of experience, we had to make it really flexible so that we could cater to all of their needs. Um, and we don't produce the majority of the work in the festival, which meant we needed to be able to basically um, receive other people's content, set up um, infrastructure for them to um, monetize their work and also to live stream um, really easily. Um, and what eventuated from all of this was Digital Fringe, which was actually our own bespoke platform. We didn't use an existing um, platform that kind of did everything. We brought together a whole lot of different systems um, and we developed something that really fitted our brand and our festival model. Um, so uh, you can see kind of the general vibe of it there. Um, and I'll come back to this slide um, as well, but um, just to run through the systems that all kind of work together to make this best of a platform. Uh, it was all hosted on our existing uh, website um, we used a video streaming solution for pre-recorded and live streamed video that was embedded into our website um, and that was JW Player. Uh, you can see it there on the bottom left, that's a live streamed um, video from uh, a glass house in a park, <laughs> um, which is a kind of example of the kinds of events that we have at Melbourne Fringe. Uh, and we needed, uh, so we have an existing ticketing system, Red 61 Ticketing, which is um, some of you might know from uh, Edinburgh Fringe, uh, Eventatron, which is our registration system, uh, Minute Chat, which is that funky little um, 90s chat plugin you can see on this slide. Um, and we also needed the ability to, for artists to basically be able to link out to any other platform. So um, we, we looked at a few different platforms for our video solution that we would embed onto this um, digital fringe uh, platform. Uh, the one we ended up with was JW Player. Um, and again, you can see an example of a pre-recorded video on JW Player in the bottom right corner here. Um, the reason that we didn't go for something like YouTube, um, and we wanted to have something that was more in-house and bespoke and um, was just to have control over the content um, and make it really easy to monetize and kind of um, ensure that people weren't able to access the content. Even if a YouTube link is unlisted, it's really easy for people to access it without having to actually be um, logged in to, um, to an account or having purchased a ticket. Um, we also had concerns, which I probably won't go into now because I don't have a whole lot of time, but um, you can ask questions later um, about YouTube's um, kind of automatic scraping of copyright content. And we had um, industry colleagues who had put on events and had the copyright um, for the music they were using, but YouTube took it down anyway. Um, and with 250 plus events, um, that was a real concern for us. Uh, you can see a couple of other um, examples of platforms that um, we linked out to from Digital Fringe. So on the top right is a Zoom show, on the bottom left is a um, Facebook Live performance. Uh, we kind of broke down the ways of providing digital content to us into a few groups and these won't work for everyone but this was how we um, conceived of it. Uh, so the first was whether the content was scheduled or on demand. And the majority of our events ended up being on demand, um, being scheduled actually, meaning that audiences had to watch them at a specific time. And that was because we wanted to create that feeling of togetherness and connection um, and you know, driving people into the same 
uh, session of the state of the performance so that they could chat alongside it, debrief after the show and really feel like they were having a shared experience. Um, and the website did all the kind of magic of controlling when that content would display. Uh, some of the work was on demand, meaning that it could basically be ad accessed at any time. And the main types of work that were in this category were um, exhibitions, really. Um, one directional live streaming, we kind of um, use that to describe a live stream where uh, your for example, you're live streaming a play that you're performing to an audience in a theatre. Um, you don't have any interaction with the audience who are watching it online. Um, it's just going out to them. This is just kind of like television. Uh, interactive live streaming where you've got two-way interaction. So an example would be a show on Zoom, um, like this one on the top right corner. You can see that all of the audience's faces can be seen. Um, they're really using that platform and that method to um, to create audience connection and to build the show. Um, Pre-recorded video, which uh, can either be an event recorded as if live, um, or it could be a highly edited video product. Um, and for us, in our case, regardless of whether the content was pre-recorded or live, we played it as if it was live when it was scheduled. So the audience could still chat alongside it and they felt they were watching a live event. Um, and this was just probably the best decision we made because um, it really helped us avoid uh, live streaming dropouts, poor connection, lags, all of those things, while still giving audience uh, the feeling of liveness. And obviously some events really do need to be live, um, but uh, it's just a huge piece of advice as um, I would always think about whether something needs to be live or whether it can be pre-recorded. And then we had other digital content, which was just literally anything else you can think of. So we had 3D online exhibitions. Um, we had uh, self-led audio tours where um, they would provide like a SoundCloud link or something. Um, and then a set of instructions so that the um, audience member knew what to do whilst listening to the audio tour. Um, for example, listen to this bit in the bath or listen to this bit while you're walking um, in the rain. Uh, radio plays, podcasts, apps, literally anything. So we rolled out this platform development over two festivals. We introduced a second festival um, called VCR Fest, which was just a little mini version of what was going to be um, the, the huge uh, Melbourne Fringe Festival in November. Uh, and this was just to kind of test, stress test the platform and make sure that um, it was doing what we needed it to do. Um, so we had 13 live events over one weekend. And then Melbourne Fringe Festival um, was predominantly digital. We actually did have about 20 in-person events in the end, but um, predominantly digital. Uh, and we had over 250 events with over 2,000 artists taking part. Um, in between the two, we learned a lot and we um, made a whole lot of changes, which um, I'm happy to, to talk about what we learned a little bit more later on as well, but I'll keep moving because I think I'm running out of time. Um, one of the big considerations that we had was how we could make it easy for artists to make income in a year where uh, options for making income as an artist were really few and far between. Um, and the ways that I, the things that we investigated were kind of four main options. Um, so the kind of paywalled option, which is mirrors what you do for an in-person event where you have to buy a ticket to be able to access the event. Um, there's like the donation pay what you want model where uh, you can attend the event, but then there's an option to pay if you want to. Uh, a script subscription model, which is, you know, like what Netflix do, um, or it can just be free. And there is so much free digital content online, which poses a lot of problems um, for artists wanting to monetize their work. Um, for us, uh, we we have a whole lot of data on what people will spend on in-person events, but we don't have, um, we basically didn't have any on what they would spend online. So um, we ended up going predominantly with um, the donation pay what you want model, and we called this choose your price. So you can see an example of what that looked like there. Um, and that worked really well for us. You can see some little stats there about what people chose to pay, converted them into pounds for you all. Um, but by chosen, chosen 
um, the average ticket price by um, paying attendees was um, $18.20. Um, for context for in-person events, um, for us it's normally about $23. So um, that's kind of it. I could go into all of it in a lot more detail. That's a really basic summary of what is a very complex platform. So definitely ask questions if there's any um, elements of it you want me to dive into. I can't talk to all of the really technical elements of live streaming, um, but I can do my best. Um, and there are just some stats about uh, the um, platform and um, and what we did, and a couple of lovely quotes um, of audience members and artists just sharing um, the impact that it had on them. That was something that we all took away. It was probably the most challenging and difficult festival we've had to do yet, uh, but it was also the most impactful. Um, please ask questions if any of that is interesting to you, and uh, thank you for having me. Thanks very much, Caitlin. After a whistle stop tour of uh, also a very complex um, event, a hybrid event by looks at it as well, with, with um, some live elements as well. Um, um, now, as a, as a bit of a folky myself, I'm very interested to hear the inside story of Celtic Connections. Um, Leslie, um, thanks very much for joining us. Hi there, everyone, and uh, thanks thanks for having me along today. Um, it's really interesting to hear um, Ben and Caitlin how how you guys have both adapted um, to online. Uh, uh, events this year as well. So um, yeah, I'm just here to talk a little bit about um, Celtic Connections and how we um, changed to a digital format um, for this year's festival. So for anyone um, who doesn't know um, about Celtic Connections, um, just very briefly, it was established in 1994 um, as the largest winter music festival of its kind and the UK's premier celebration of Celtic music. So in a normal year, um, when we have live audiences, it would take place in January over 18 days and we would use um, around 28 venues um, throughout the city uh, of Glasgow and welcome uh, and host 300 events, welcoming 1,200 artists to the city over that period. So um, like everyone else, um, we had to had to change that format this year. Um, so we, we initially looked at what we were calling a digital first approach. Um, and what we hoped to do was to um, record all of our um, content live in January um, in Glasgow Royal Concert Hall and that that would be streamed live. Um, and part of the kind of reason for that was that we wanted to kind of be in a space where if guidance allowed at, at, at any point in time um, to allowed us to bring in audiences that we could do that um, quite easily, that we could we could um, add them into the um, to our plans. So even if that meant that we could have 20 or 50 people in a 2000 capacity venue, we, we kind of felt really strongly that we wanted to invite um, audiences if we can. So I, I'm very jealous, um, Caitlin, that you were able to kind of have some, some live audiences this year. Um, obviously, um, as everyone knows, um, towards the end of last year, that looked less and less likely. So we made a decision in October um, to pre-record all of our content uh, for a digital festival. So filming took place um, between November um, and right through until the first um, weekend of the festival um, in January. Um, so we recorded all of our content in advance. Um, that kind of allowed us to be a little bit more creative in what we were what we were um, showing, and I think um, I think like um, Ben and Caitlin have said as well that um, we we definitely felt very quickly um, found that we had we had our roles had changed from being live music producers to to kind of TV producers um, over that period. So we we as part of our kind of digital content, we really wanted to kind of showcase Glasgow. So we continued to kind of um, to film in various venues throughout the city, um, including Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, the Old Fruit Market, um, the National Piping Centre, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, um, and the Hydro as well. And we also um, we also kind of really looked at some kind of outside shots of the city to kind of really get that um, that message across um, of, of and sense of place. Um, 
the international is, is a really kind of big element of uh, Celtic connection. So we also um, asked some artists, uh, some international artists to film uh, remotely for us as well. So we had artists like Levan de Noir who um, hired a venue in Montreal and kind of filmed a whole night with us. We got go um, logos sent over there and logos created so that they had kind of all, all the brand and, and really made them made it look like it was it was part of the, the full festival as well. Um, so lots of kind of different international content that we had there as well. We, um, uh, like everyone, I, I think we didn't really know um, how people would react to an online festival, um, but we um, we were really pleased. We saw 27,000 passes um, for this year's uh, online festival, and that was a mixture of full festival passes, which gave audiences access to all the content across the, the festival, um, and then show uh, tickets for individual shows as well. We had people watching from 65 countries, um, and we um, recruited 650 Celtic rovers. So that would be our kind of um, our kind of uh, our Celtic friends. We, we used to call them. So they are um, they would pay a little bit extra for um, more kind of additional and kind of exclusive content um, to support the festival. And then we sent an evaluation out um, just at the end to kind of try and gauge what worked and what didn't and what people enjoyed. Um, and also to try and figure out how many people um, would watch um, with one ticket or one pass. Um, I guess I guess when people come to live shows, each individual has a ticket. But when it's online, um, it's very difficult to know how many people are watching with, with the one pass. So um, the results of that came back um, and said that there were around, um, on average, um, four people per household watching during this year's festival. Um, so in terms of, of um, choosing a platform to um, to present our online product on, um, we looked at we basically looked at what we needed a platform to do. So we looked at the kind of basic functionality um, and what our requirements might be. So um, I've just listed some of them here. So um, some of the main things that we were looking for was that the platform could host um, paid for and free content. Um, we were filming with a TV um, broadcast production company, um, so we wanted to make sure that um, the platform could um, host high quality streaming so that we weren't kind of losing any resolution um, in the upload process. The platform had to be reliable for us um, kinda, and kind of have a proven track record and it had to be easy to use um, both for ourselves having never um, never presented a festival in this way before um, but also for the audience um, as well and we really wanted it to have a customer service team that could answer any queries that we had really quickly um, but also um, again um, help any uh, customers um, with any kind of technical queries that they had as well. So the Celtic Connections Festival, um, we have our own website, CelticConnections.com. Um, we decided to use Vimeo OTT, um, and the, our, our Vimeo site was uh, CelticConnections.vhx.tv, and all of our content sat on there. Um, and this uh, image that you can see here is just the one of the kind of initial screens. So we had a countdown just before the videos um, started. Um, which kind of added a kind of bit of sense of anticipation and, and excitement um, for our audiences. So just looking at um, some of the digital platforms that we considered. So we we looked at um, uh, some streaming platforms, also some ticketing um, sites as well. And we kind of um, tried to do a kind of comparison between all of them alongside the functionality that we were looking for to find out which platform would work for us um, would work for us the best and kind of fit our needs um, most. So for, for anyone um, who doesn't know, Glasgow uh, Celtic Connections, sorry, um, is part of Glasgow Life. Um, so we decided to go for uh, Vimeo OTT um, and part of that was so that um, that could be used throughout um, throughout the organisation um, over the year. So Glasgow Life also presents um, a variety of different festivals and events, including I Write, um, Glasgow Mela, GI and Merchant City Festival. Um, so that kind of provided um, a platform that could be used throughout uh, the organisation um, going forward. Um, 
I'm just going to show you quickly here. So when I was talking about ease of use, so um, our uh, audience members, our customers, when they bought a ticket, so if you bought a festival pass or you were a Celtic Rover, um, you basically set up your account with Vimeo. Um, and then as we released videos, they would appear within your account. So um, that kind of ease of use was something that was really important. People didn't have to go finding the correct link for the right day that they were looking for or the right show that they were looking for. They basically went to the same place each day and that content was there for them. So it was really easy for them to find um, and quite kind of user friendly um, when, when they got things set up. And then likewise, this is just a, a kind of quick um, a quick kind of image of the back end. So for the festival pass, which would be our product, um, we just add videos into that um, and we can also um, take them out um, whenever you want as well. So you can make them available for um, as long as you want. It gives you the option um, if you want to make them available for download or not um, as well. So one, one of the things actually that was quite interesting about this, which we weren't aware of um, before uh, we, we started, was that there's no option to kind of automatically um, set up release of videos. Um, so you can't schedule them in, in advance. And it really was a kind of manual process um, for us to do that. Um, so that's something that I think, um, I, yeah, I, we've, we've kind of been speaking to Vimeo about, um, about going forward and um, to see if that's something that they might be able um, to, to kind of change for us. Um, and then just uh, in terms of, of monetizing, um, the platform actually um, kind of really helped us to try and um, monetize, monetize the festival. So we had a, a range of um, different pricing options that we were able to use. So we had free shows. Um, we had our Celtic Rovers that I said um, earlier um, paid a little bit extra. So I think their, their ticket price was £45. Um, we had an early bird price um, of £30 for the full festival pass, and that gave people access to 29 concerts over the, the full festival period. And that was available from kind of December time through to January before it went up to the full price of, of £40. And then people um, also had the option if they wanted to buy a ticket for just one show, um, they were able to do that. But the, the messaging that we were putting out was that if um, basically if you were going to watch two or three shows, then it was really worth your while buying the full um, festival pass. Um, and we kind of tried to make the, the pass um, really affordable. We wanted as many people to kind of watch and experience the whole festival as possible. Um, so we really pushed the donation message in, and that was both a point of purchase. So um, kind of like um, pay what you want, we, we had a minimum pricing, but then if people wanted to donate on top of that, that messaging was there at a point of um, purchase as well. But then also within the, the videos um, that we were putting out, so the programmes that we released, we were able to um, curate these end board so this image that you see on the on the right hand side here this was one of our donation messaging um, end boards which would be at the very start of the program so just before the the countdown people would see that and um, hopefully um, try and donate um, to, to the festival um, there's also opportunities um, for advertising and sponsorship and i guess kind of gives sponsors um, a bit more kind of a uh, access more, more reach um, than they might have for an individual show um, at the festival um, just a couple of examples we um we worked with calmac um, who sponsored the festival again this year um, and curated a whole program um, based around um, the islands in scotland so that the program was called home from the sea and we um we uh, asked some musicians around all of those islands um, to record some footage and send back to us and created a show called uh, Home from the Sea um, to kind of really, um, really kind of get that Calmac message um, out there. Um, and then likewise with the Glen Turret, we were able to, um, which is a, a whiskey company, um, we were able to kind of show their um, distilling process and a kind of longer, um, longer kind of video really about their uh, their company and their product um, than we might um, otherwise have been able to do in a live um, in a live format. And then and then finally, um, something that we didn't do was we we didn't have any kind of merchandise for the festival this year, but we certainly had quite a few comments of people looking for it. So in terms of monetizing, that might be a way um, for festivals and events um, in future 
um, to try and, and kind of monetize and, and maybe make um, some more income uh, from their online events as kind of selling merchandise uh, in advance. Um, we, we just didn't have the time or resource to be able to do that this year. Um, and I think we might have struggled with um, some postage overseas, um, especially in Europe, um, just on the, on the cusp of uh, Brexit in January. So, um, but something definitely for us to consider in the future. And then, yeah, this last slide just kind of shows you how we were able to um, how we were able to film some of the artists. So this was the Celtic Connections big band, and um, I guess maybe one of the benefits of of having no audiences, although we're all desperate for them to come back, was that we were able to make our days our filming days quite a bit longer, um, and we could film more content um, on each filming day. Um, but also we had more space, so we had the whole, the whole venue that we could use. Um, so this this uh, the big band here actually comes out from the stage onto the floor of Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, um, which allowed us to um, film more artists um, as part of that big band. Um, so, so some benefits, but um, I guess um, we're all desperate for uh, live audiences to come back. So yeah, I hope that's useful. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much, Leslie. What, what a great way to showcase your um, fantastic um, venues and, and, and artists. Um, you, you talked quite a bit there about monetization and, and how, how the platform sort of helped you there and, and, and also what, what, what you found out that you could do in, in future using a platform like that. Um, Caitlin, perhaps um, would, would you be able to, to, to um, share a bit more information about how, how your choice of platform helped you to, to, to monetize the Melbourne Fringe? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I think I, I briefly started to talk about the choose your price ticketing option that we um, that we kind of went with. Um, we actually, to make kind of to expand on that, we actually had a few different options, um, which was all in line with kind of making it as flexible as possible for all of our open access artists. So um, we allowed them to choose whether they wanted to have it pre um, paid in advance um choose your price uh, or completely free um, and the majority went with choose your price um, uh, for the paid pre-ticketed option the way that you know um our ticketing system red 61 um and having it like matched with having everything on our website and really controlled by us meant that we were able to uh, really easily limit um, those who could watch the events based on whether they had an account with Red61, um, had an account on our website and were logged into that account and then they could access the ticket. So um, yeah, it was really useful in that way. Um, and then for the choose your price ticketing, we were kind of able to create multiple different price types um, to give options in $5 increments. Um, I guess, what we did, uh, not everyone maybe, uh, depending on the scale of the event, maybe not everyone has the, the resources to do it to that degree. Um, but actually you can really easily um, monetize most kinds of digital events by simply looking for a really cheap and easy to use ticketing system um, and uh, ensuring that when they book a ticket you can send them a link to whatever the content is um, in the email and I guess that's the kind of most basic way of, of doing it. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. So, so that's that's the, the sort of the income side of the, the budget equation. We've got a question from, from the audience here about um, about cost. Are you able to um, to um, Tell us what, what, what did your platform cost, Caitlin? You're able to share that information. The startup cost. The question is, what was the startup cost of Melbourne Fringe's platform? Yeah, it's a good question. There were lots of different costs involved. Um, and uh, off the top of my head, I don't have um, the total figure, but the website development was around about uh, $20,000. Um, and that was making the developments to our existing website. Um, plus we pay uh, fees for every ticket sold um, to Red61, uh, plus we paid for Minute Chat, um, which was the plugin. So we did, that was incredibly cheap. Um, we probably paid $500 or something total. Mm -hmm. um, and then for JW Player, um, that was a fair amount of money. Um, 
we originally went with a much cheaper option, which would have been around about, um, which was Decas, which would have been around about the $5,000 mark. Um, and JW Player was um, closer to about 30,000 um, for what we needed. We had a huge amount of content though. Um, we had, you know, nearly 2000 different individual um, performances live and pre-recorded. So yeah, our case is very, um, yeah, very large scale. Um, sure. And we were really lucky to get funding. Um, our government uh, were, I don't know what it's like over there, but they were very, very keen to give funding for any digital innovation last year. And um, we really jumped on it all. So we got funding from our um, local council as well as the Australian Council for the Arts. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, not an insubstantial amount of money is it needed to invest in, in these platforms, and um, and they're not um, they're not full fail safe either. Um, sometimes the technology can can go wrong. Um, Leslie, are you able to, to perhaps tell us a little bit about it? Did you have any technical issues that you overcame? As a, yeah, the, we um, did. The great success <laughs> of Celtic Connections, but um, any hiccups? Yeah. We, we did have some technical issues and not I, I, I mean um not necessarily um entirely at the the at the fault of the platform as such it was probably more of a, a us not having an understanding of how it worked or how the system worked fully worked kind of thing so one of the issues that we had on the the opening night of the festival was that so so you have a product which would be like our festival pass um, as i showed you and then you you bring you release the videos um, into you you add the video into that so what we didn't realize um was that when people paid for their pass the money wasn't taken from their account until the product was released so we were releasing the product um, so we had added the video once it had been edited and everything together we added the video to the product and then released that at 25 so our opening night went out at half past seven um, on a Thursday night I think it was um, and we released that at 25 past seven as as you would with a with a live video um, but what happened at that point which we weren't aware of and weren't expecting was that people's credit cards were all being charged at that point in time so for most people, I think there was about 14,000 people um, kind of tuning in on that opening night. It was absolutely fine, but we had around 200. I think we had about 200 people whose cards had been rejected but, uh, from either from a variety of reasons, either um, their cards had expired or um, they, they weren't expecting the payment. So I've been blocked or there was no money in their account it was post Christmas time. So um, that that caused us a huge issue. And we um, we we have um, two people who uh, work in our marketing team, and they basically became for for that opening weekend. They were customer support, they were technical support, um, and box office, and kind of didn't really have a lot of time um, for marketing. So that was a huge kind of learning curve um, for us. And and we did have we had that customer support there from Vimeo. We had all their we had kind of put a list of FAQs out, which we were sending to people. We um, we had the the Vimeo support um, address um, at kind of every kind of point whenever um, people had any uh, issues. But actually, the reality was that any issues at all, people went straight to social media, um, which meant that it was our marketing team who had to kind of pick all of that up, and um, our marketing team of two um, had to kind of pick all of that up. So that became a huge stress. But what we what we learned from that was that kind of going forward, we released the product but then added the video at the end so we added the video just with a few minutes to go but that was kind of part of that i guess one of the one of the the cons um of the the, the platform that we used is that you couldn't do that kind of scheduling ahead that it was a kind of manual process so and and we were all still working at home so that was also really worrying and kind of really tricky you, you didn't just have one person who was responsible for that we had to kind of have um a kind of rota almost of two or three people in case someone's home broadband wasn't working or mm -hmm. so things like that none, none of us like like, like um, i'm sure everyone else here um, weren't in the office so um those kind of issues as well but that was kind of how we resolved yeah. that going forward that we released the product and um and then adding the video yeah 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 the, there's, there's always sort of niggles and sort of user experience sort of issues that you're not going to be aware of until then um, yeah. and when you're dealing with, with live events it's it's happening in real time um yeah. the other people that um 
but obviously to back to the, the, the financials of this, there are people that obviously need to benefit from, from events like yours, are, are the artists and the performers. We had a question from um, from the audience that was sent in before the, um, the event. And it's a question about PRS licensing. Um, did going digital bring any complications in terms of uh, handling the rights of any of the content that you programmed? Maybe Leslie, this is another one for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are um, in terms of PRS. We we're still having ongoing conversations with PRS. Um, so for a, for a live event, um, again, I'm sure most people here here know this, but for a live event, you would pay for a PRS license, which is usually based on 4.2% um, of your um, audience. Um, so the number of people who have tickets. Um, However, in the last years, everything's went online. That hasn't quite been ironed out by PRS as to how this was going to work. Um, so where, where you would have that for a live, um, for your live show, um, if that content, if that show was being filmed and was going to be broadcast for us, that would normally be by BBC. Um, so it would be going out on a, on one of the kind of BBC channels, so TV or radio. Um, they would look after the sync fees and the mechanical rights for that. So they would actually take care of any um, any licensing for broadcast. But I guess as event organisers now um, doing digital events, that responsibility falls on falls on us, which I think a lot of people aren't aren't aware of. Um, and over the kind of last year, PRS have been trying to get on top of it, and but there's been a lot of figures kind of going around between seven and seventeen percent um, of your income of your digital income to to go towards this um, license. So they've had mm -hmm. quite a bit of negative press, and I think they've just finished. Um, there was a public consultation which I believe just finished last week, and they are kind of now trying to kind of collate all of that together to kind of try and come up with some kind of solution as to how to make that easier for um, events and festival promoters um, kind of going forward. But for us, that's still an ongoing um, conversation that we're having with PRS at the moment. But I think for for anyone, I would I would say if you're putting something on online at the moment is to to get in touch with PRS and here in Scotland we've got we've got a great um a great uh, advocate for PRS um, up here who is really listening to the artists and the writers um, but also kind of understands some of the concerns that um, event promoters um, have as well so yeah sorry I was just going to say that um it's really interesting to hear you talk about it because we are having the exact same issues in in Australia with a, um, a um, representative body which is One Music and it's just um, not being figured out how how to make it profitable and viable for, for especially independent artists which we work with and it's it's caused um, us a lot of issues and um, we yeah we're having um, the same kinds of conversations so it's interesting to hear that it's happening kind of globally. Mm. Yes, it's so complicated. Isn't it? Um, another question that, that we had in um, from the audience was um, not 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 everyone is, is organising events on the scale of, um, of Melbourne Fringe, um, but um, perhaps Kevin, you might be able to have some advice for students um, and people planning smaller events uh, where budgets are, are very limited. Are you aware of any platforms that maybe some of your grassroots sort of um, network might might use? Yeah, I can definitely talk about that. Um, we work with a lot of artists in exactly that boat, and so. Um, whilst we were kind of providing this infrastructure for them, uh, we also worked with a lot of artists who were um, putting their event on a different platform um, rather than kind of giving us a pre-recorded video. Um, and so we talked a lot um, about what kind of platforms um, work for what kind of events. And as I said before, there's like a very cheap and easy way to do this, which is to put um, if it's a if it's a video, put it on YouTube or Vimeo or um, or something like that, and then um, find some really uh, easy to use ticketing system. I, I don't know what the big ones are over there, but um, <laughs> from Red Sixty One, but um, and then uh, through that you can use that to kind of send the link out to everyone. Um, my biggest recommendation and something that we kind of saw to a huge scale in our festival is uh, Zoom. Um, even if your event is kind of a theatre show, whatever kind of show it is, Zoom can actually be a really interesting way to um, to 
put on an event. Um, it's really interactive, so it's great for um, like that that clip or that um, image that I had on my slideshow um, where all of the audience members can be seen in that particular show. The artist sent in advance uh, backgrounds, virtual backgrounds to all of the audience that had booked so that they would all join the Zoom with that virtual background. Um, and you can use it in really interesting and experimental ways. It obviously also works really well for panel discussions, anything that kind of requires a bit of um, two-way interactivity. And it's also really easy to monitor. So like I was saying before about, um, you know, working with an air platform made it really easy to make sure that people could only attend if they had a ticket. With Zoom, you can have a waiting room. So um, it's another way to kind of act as if you have a door list. And all of that is basically free unless you get, um, unless you think you're going to have a large audience, um, in which case you can upgrade your Zoom account. Um, but I would say that's a really, really great solution to um, a simple way to kind of have a live event um, that is free and uh, cheap. And then obviously Facebook and Instagram Live are really great if you're wanting to put on um, a really a free event. Um, it's a really great way to just get wide reach and um, use your existing audience. Mm. Thanks so much, Kaylin. We've got so many questions um, coming in from the audience. I'm, I'm really sorry that we're not going to have time to, um, to, to address all of them. And there's one here about um, did you have to renegotiate terms and fees with your artists? Um, was there a risk of, of, of copyright infringement? Was that a, an issue? In yeah, I mean, we, live? yeah, I guess for us, um, we we um, we worked pretty close with the legal team at Glasgow Life um, throughout the year to kind of try and update our contracts um, because it was a very different um, festival. It was a de very different um, offer that we were doing. So, um, yeah, we basically just included in our contracts um, who the rights belong to, what permissions we had to use the footage, what permissions um, the artist might have post-festival if they wanted to use it for promo or anything like that. So it was really just a case of kind of working to see what, what worked for us, but was also fair for the artists um, at this point uh, as well. Thanks. Um, somebody said something hi Leslie, I thought Celtic Connections looked and sounded amazing this year. Looking back on things, is there anything in particular you would change with the show? So that's uh, probably a good question for both of you. What, what would you do, do differently, mm -hmm. benefit of hindsight? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for us, we we yeah. Uh, so we didn't. Um, in terms of the content that we put out, they very much became rather than kind of um, a kind of live gig, as as people have maybe seen throughout the year quite uh, frequently online. Um, they were very much kind of like TV programs, and we kind of felt that that worked quite well. Um, there was they were quite kind of varied. We were able to add that international element. Um, we could have um, interviews and kind of artists um, introducing their tracks, but away from the stage. So actually, that was something that we tried on the the first day of filming. Um, we had the artists doing their links um, on stage as if it was like an as live show, and it just didn't work. We we knew straight away. We were like, it doesn't work. They're talking to an audience that aren't there. You know, there's no one. There's no one in this venue. Um, they look awkward and things. So. That was one of the things that we kind of changed, I guess, um, pretty quickly on in filming. That we we filmed a uh, filmed those links separately, so we were kind of able to kind of make a program out, out of um, the footage, and I, and I think that worked um, quite well. Going forward, um, I guess, um, yeah, we would hope. I, I think, like everyone, we hope that we're back to life, um, but there might be some elements of digital um, that we could hopefully take take forward and kind of add to in the future. Caitlin, any, um, anything you would do differently? Yeah, I guess we actually already had the opportunity to do to do that um, because we did two festivals. After the first one, we actually changed a lot. Um, so we had the opportunity to reflect and we got um, feedback from audiences and artists. The main change that we made was um, was for the first festival, VCR Fest, we did pretty much everything live streamed um, and it caused so many issues, um, especially because a lot of our artists were, like we had one artist that was um, doing a show from a hotel room uh, and it's an amazing, incredible show, um, but they were using the hotel's internet connection um, 
and because we didn't have control over what they were doing because we were working you know behind our own screens and our own um as kind of the we weren't directly producing these events um we just had to kind of sit back and and um and you know deal with it um so what we what we did was we encouraged um artists especially artists who were new um and really new to live streaming uh where possible to um go with a pre-record or like pre-record it as if live a perform it live pre-recorded and then um, we gave them an infrastructure to um still have it scheduled um so that was a huge learning for us and the other main one was I don't think we realized, I don't know if you feel the same, Leslie and Ben, but I don't think we realized how all consuming a digital festival or a digital event could be. We, I think we just thought, oh, well, it's online, so it's not gonna be, you know, we'll be able to do this within our resources. But um, we absolutely burnt ourselves out and having to do it under such short amount of time. Um, uh, and we also didn't have the expertise on staff, so um, we, we ended up hiring a couple of um, external people and um, with that real specific expertise. Um, and now with all of that in mind, we're really thinking about how we can um, move forward with a simplified version of what we did um, because it was really a lot of work. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is, um, going digital is not, is, not, um, is not simple, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's essential in, in this day and age. So, um, there's so many questions here. I'm really sorry to all the audience members who've um, asked us questions, but we'll try and get back to you by, by email afterwards um, and to answer some, some of these, um, these great questions that have come in. Um, and thank you so much, Leslie and, and Caitlin, for, for speaking and sharing your, your expertise today on behalf of Events Scotland. Um, thanks for um, putting this together. And um, I'd just like to take this opportunity as well to remind you all to keep the 7th and the 8th of December in your diaries for, for Host City, um, the largest meeting of cities and sports, business and cultural events, which takes place either in Glasgow or online. If you sign up for Host City's newsletter on hostcity.com, we'll keep you updated on, on, on plans for that.